Welcome everyone, and we are so sorry for it, the last minute change to be a 100% live streaming event. So we really appreciate your understanding, and again, apologize for the inconvenience. But nonetheless, we are so happy you are joining us via the live stream. We host this government analytics breakfast forum along with REI Systems. We meet about once every other month, and the purpose is to create a community of people in academia and industry who are interested in talking about how analytics are being used in the public sector to solve various challenges. Our speaker will present today for, well, our uh, two speakers will present today for approximately 30 minutes or so, and then we will take questions at the end. And we very much encourage you to post your questions in the chat box. Our panelists will be delighted to answer them. We very much want to have a discussion, so please submit questions so that we can have a conversation about the presentation today. We also encourage you to tweet about the event using the hashtag GabForum. And note that a recording of the event will be posted online about 48 hours afterwards, so you're welcome to review what was said or share the recording with your colleagues. We, again, thank you for taking some time out of your day to participate, and I will now turn the program over to my colleague at REI Systems, Jeff Myers, to introduce our speakers. Thanks, Jen, and thank all of you for joining us. Uh, unfortunately, not in person, so you don't have a chance to get to meet each other. Uh, if you haven't been to one of these events, I think that's actually one of the best pieces, which is people get to kind of talk with each other about common problems they face and get ideas from each other about how to solve them as well as share the successes they've had. Um, it's a good networking opportunity, and we can certainly share around the list of folks uh, who have uh, attended for this event with you, and if you are interested in trying to reach out to each other, we can certainly help facilitate that as well. I also want to put in a quick plug, hopefully in person, if things have calmed down, on May 5th we'll have our next iteration of this event. We'll have che Trey Bradley, who works with the General Services Administration in support of the Chief Data Officers Council, and a Johns Hopkins Government Analytics Program student, Jed Herman, who also works at Results for America, helping think through potential performance metrics that may work across a variety of different government agencies and levels. And they'll be discussing the use of data and evidence for performance management and for chief data officers' kind of challenges, both in gathering the data as well as using it. So we'll look forward to that on May 5th. And again, hopefully we'll be back together in person at that point. Um, just a brief bit about REI. REI works with a number of federal agencies. One of the ones that we're focused on right now is the Health Resources and Services Administration, which funds public health clinics throughout the country. We're bringing artificial intelligence, uh, grants management, a variety of different analytic tools, not only to HRSA, but also to the Federal Emergency Management Agency, as well as to NASA and U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services with some of our most recent activities. Um, we look forward and hope to sponsoring many more of these events because we think that the the use of data and evidence is one of the most important things that can help government improve its performance and capabilities and focus in the areas that are most important to the American people, the customer of the government. Um, I do want to mention, though, that uh, we're going to have an hour today. We're going to have a half-hour presentation by our two kind panelists. And the panelists include Diana Epstein, who is the senior uh, evidence team lead for the Office of Management and Budget. She clearly has a cross-government perspective, but she's also got a perspective from pro former work outside of government. She's worked at Apt Associates, um, as well as, I apologize, within government for the Corporation for National and Community Service. So she's had roles in a variety of sectors and now kind of has a cross-government perspective, which I think will be quite valuable to you. Um, she holds a Master in Public Policy from the University of California, Berkeley, Go Bears, uh, as well as a PhD from the Rand Corporation. She's joined by a person from a particular agency to help give us some real concrete context to some of the conversation today, and that is uh, Christina Yancey. Uh, she has worked, uh, uh, works at leading the program evaluation effort at the Department of Labor, coordinating evaluation decisions and judgments across a variety of components within the Department of Labor. And uh, Dr. Yancey has previously also served in similar roles with the Department of Justice's Office of Justice Programs. She holds a PhD from American University here in Washington, DC. And I look forward to their comments and thoughts that they will share with you with respect to the Evidence Act, uh, the recent uh, legislation from Congress signed by the President that calls for a stronger and more continuous use of data and evidence in government decision making and management. So with that, let me turn it over to Dr. Diana Epstein. Thank you so much for joining us, Diana and Christina. We look forward to hearing from you. Great. All right. Thanks. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you all today. Um, so I have a lot of material to present. I'm going to go very quickly because I want to leave plenty of time for Christina and then for discussion. Uh, but my hope is to give you all an overview of the Foundations for Evidence-Based Policymaking Act. 
um, which is a, a recent piece of legislation that we think presents a great opportunity for government to really improve the way that it uses data and evidence for decision making. Okay, so what is the Evidence Act? So this all started with the Commission on Evidence-Based Policymaking, um, which was a bipartisan commission uh, set up by then Speaker Paul Ryan and Senator Patty Murray. Um, it had a wide variety of expertise, everything from program evaluation and statistics to data governance and privacy experts. They met for about 18 months uh, and then produced a really comprehensive report with 22 recommendations to encourage systematic planning for evidence building, high quality data governance, and coordinated support for privacy protected data sharing. Um, it's a really, like I said, an excellent report. It is quite long, has a lot of really detailed appendices, um, but there is an executive summary that's short and quite readable, so I'd encourage you to check that out if you haven't already. Okay, so they released this report, um, and then it resulted in uh, some legislation. So again, uh, then Speaker Paul Ryan and Senator Murray um, shortly after the re release of the report, introduced a bill that would address about half of the commission's recommendations. Um, these were thought to be sort of, I don't want to say the low-hanging fruit, but some of the, the recommendations that were more implementable um, and that would serve as foundational elements. So this uh, passed through the House very quickly and then sort of sat in the Senate for quite a while, as, as often happens. Um, but you know, at the end of calendar year 2018, the bill passed. Uh, and then was signed into law at, at the beginning of January of last year. So the bill includes three titles, and I'm going to talk about each of these in turn. So Title I addresses federal evidence building activities. Um, Title II is all about open data and actually incorporates a separate piece of legislation that was moving in parallel at the time but was then incorporated into this bill. Uh, and then Title Three is all about um, protecting confidential information, so that's what we call SIPC. Okay, so why is this such a big deal? Why should we care about the Evidence Act? So there's really three key ideas here. Um, the first is that evidence-based policymaking needs systematic planning, um, and I'll talk about why this is different than perhaps how we've been doing things in the federal space. Um, second, we need good data governance in order to use federal data assets effectively. And then finally, we need coordinated support in order to share data effectively while also protecting privacy and confidentiality. Okay, so first, this idea that evidence-based policymaking requires systematic planning. So the idea here is that we need to start with the questions. So we need to identify the key questions where the answers would really help federal agencies execute their missions and deliver services more effectively. Then we need to determine the right approach to answering those questions. Um, at the same time, we need to determine what capacity we currently have to answer these questions and then figure out how we might fill capacity gaps where they exist. Um, so again, this is different than how we have often been doing evidence building, which is more of an ad hoc approach, not a systematic. Okay, second, this idea that um, we need really high quality data governance um, in order to use federal data well, to really leverage federal data as a strategic asset. Um, and Christina, I think, is going to touch on this point, so I won't spend too much time on it. But essentially, as we all know, the federal government has a, a huge amount of data. And we want to figure out how to better use this. Um, we want to make federal data available both to other federal agencies and to external data users whenever we can, but we can't just put it out there, right? We have to, we have to curate the data, we have to document what we have using inventories, code books, and, and then usable metadata as well. Um, we want to make data open and available to the public, but we also need to develop some additional tools and technologies to do that effectively. Okay, third, and importantly, um, we need to better share data that is restricted use, so that has um, you know, confidential information, but if joined together, if linked and leveraged, it could answer some really high value questions. But we have to do this while protecting privacy and confidentiality. So the default position um, for data sharing has tended to be no, 
Um, the Evidence Act really tries to change this to a yes and less mentality. But, you know, again, to do this, we have to articulate high confidentiality standards. And we need to empower and identify trusted intermediaries to facilitate that data sharing. Okay, so moving on here. Um, again, so sort of to bring this back to a higher level, why do we care about this? So what, what is the Evidence Act changing? Um, it's important to note, I think, this, this builds on long-standing principles, underlying federal policies and data infrastructure, so we're not starting from scratch here. We have a lot already to work with, um, but the law does create a new paradigm for federal agencies to think about how they build evidence and, and how they use data. So it does this in a number of ways. Um, it, it first of all focuses on leadership. So it creates three new senior positions, three new senior officials at federal agencies who are responsible for implementing the Evidence Act. Um, and, and it emphasizes collaboration and coordination among those senior officials as well as others in the agency who are responsible for data use, data governance, data protection, and evidence building. Um, it, Again, as I mentioned earlier, it puts in place a more strategic approach to evidence building. So there are places in the federal government that are building evidence well, but there are lots of places where this is not happening well. There are lots of places where um, evidence is being built in response to a particular mandate, a particular law, but for the most part, agencies are not taking a, a holistic, strategic approach, starting with those questions and then working down to figure out how to best answer those priority questions. So this really shifts that narrative to a more strategic approach. And then finally, it elevates program evaluation as a key agency function. Uh, and this is really important because there are some kinds of questions, like is a program or policy working as intended? Is it causing the intended changes? Those can only be answered by evaluations. And so we've had a statutory system for performance. We have a statutory system for statistics. We did not have a statutory system for evaluation until this law. So this is actually really important to fill that gap so that agencies, again, are systematically across the board ans uh, asking and then answering evaluative questions. Um, so the Evidence Act isn't happening in a vacuum. It complements other federal efforts that are underway. Um, I won't go into these too much, but just to note, uh, there is a federal data strategy, which is part of the President's management agenda. Again, that, that complements very well the Evidence Act um, and the action plan for the federal data strategy. Um, does sort of attempt to operationalize a lot of the Evidence Act's requirements. Um, again, on the open data front, um, there is o there's already policy on open data. This law sort of strengthened and, and codifies open data policy, um, as well as build on, on other legislation like the Data Act and the Geospatial Data Act. Um, and again, at OMB, where I work, we're really working hard to make sure that these efforts are complementary and aligned. Um, the last thing we want to do is have federal agencies confused or feel like there are too many disparate requirements being piled on them. Um, this is easier said than done. Uh, you know, policy tends to sort of layer on top of each other, but we're trying really hard to make sure these things fit together and make sense that they can actually be implemented. Okay, so to that point, um, so this is the approach we took at OMB. So when a law like this passes, um, this is not atypical for there to be many provisions in the law that say, you know, OMB should, must issue guidance. And the guidance is meant to then provide detail to agencies about how to actually implement the law. So this law is, is no different. There are many, many things where OMB is supposed to issue guidance. Um, there are two, two ways we could have done this. So one is we just put out guidance one at a time, lots and lots of different guidance, um, and then say agencies, you know, try, try your best to make sense of this. Um, we decided a different approach was needed, and so we decided instead to put the guidance into just four pieces. So four pieces of guidance that would be more comprehensive, more integrated across functions. So it required us at OMB to work across offices in new ways for us. So to have folks, for example, from my team, the evidence team, working together with folks from OIRA, working together with folks from OFCIO's office, working together with folks on the budget side, on the performance side, to really try to figure out 
How can we write guidance for agencies that takes into account all these different perspectives so that the, the, on the receiving end, the agencies can actually do something with it that will help them? Um, so the first phase of guidance, um, I'll talk about in a minute, was issued in July, and that's a foundational piece that deals with learning agendas and those key personnel and some of the plans that are required. There'll be guidance forthcoming on open data related to Title II, additional guidance on and regs on SIPSI, the Title III part, uh, and then additional guidance on program evaluation standards and practices. Um, which actually should be um, available, I'm hoping, today. So late breaking news, um, that should be available um, within a couple hours, I think. So that, that's good news there. Okay, so as I mentioned, um, we're really trying for a coordinated and collaborative approach. Um, we hope that this makes it easier for agencies to do what they have to do. Um, we're trying to also be as flexible as possible. So again, there are two different ways to do this kind of thing. One is very prescriptive and say you must do X, Y, Z exactly in this way. Another approach, the one we decided to take, was to be more flexible, to sort of put in place um, a framework while offering agencies the ability to tailor requirements to meet their specific needs. And we felt like by doing that, agencies could own it um, and implement the, the law in a way that was meaningful for them. We do not want this to be a compliance require, uh, compliance exercise, and I can't really stress that enough. Um, a law like this always has the potential to just be seen as a long list of new requirements. Agencies just check the box, check the box, I did it, I did it, move on. That's not what we want. We want, um, we want this to be embraced. We think it has the potential to really improve decision making, to improve the ways that we build and use evidence, but agencies have to own it. They have to feel like they're doing it in a meaningful way that makes sense for their particular context, for their particular mission area. Okay, so I'll just quickly talk about a couple of the key pieces of um, Title I, which is that foundational piece about federal evidence building efforts. So first, um, learning agendas. So learning agendas are at the heart of this new approach to evidence building. Um, the law calls them evidence building plans, but we've been calling them learning agendas for a number of years, and this is the term that's been more socialized um, in the community for a while. So what is a learning agenda? Um, it's a systematic plan for identifying and addressing priority questions relevant to the programs, policies, and regulations of the agency. So again, it's going back to what are those key questions? If we could lay out the key questions that we have, if, that if we answer them, it would really allow us to do our job better. Those are mission questions and operational questions. They should be things that it may take you years to answer, as well as questions where it might take a month or six months to answer. But in doing so, would really improve the way that you your function. Um, again, so this is supposed to be um, an iterative exercise where you lay out the questions, you start to answer them, and then you take the learnings and feed that back into the next set of questions that you that you ask. Um, the interesting thing here is that learning agendas are part now part of agency strategic plans. So there's a, a real explicit link to the agency's strategy and the strategic objectives and goals. Um, again, it, you know, I think there's a couple of other elements of this that are that are very interesting. One is a requirement for stakeholder engagement. So the law actually requires that agencies engage a range of stakeholders in the learning agenda process. So that has the potential to really bring in a variety of different perspectives and views. Um, and then finally, I want to make the point about transparency. So uh, because learning agendas are part of strategic plans, strategic plans are public documents. So these will eventually be publicly posted. And that's a really important um, signal for agencies to say, these are the questions we think are important. These are the questions we plan to focus on. And it offers the opportunity for partnerships too, because an agency is signaling, these are the questions um, that we need help answering potentially. Partners on the outside, if you want your research to be more policy relevant, please you know, align your research portfolio with these questions so that there's sort of a mutual benefit going on. So that's the hope. 
Um, quickly, the, on the personnel, so like I mentioned earlier, the law creates three new positions. All agencies now have to have chief data officers, and then the CFO Act agencies, so the 24 largest, have to have evaluation officers and statistical officials. So these are the, the key folks responsible for implementing the Evidence Act. Um, there are corresponding councils for each of these groups. So, uh, for example, the Evaluation Officer Council meets monthly. Um, and these councils provide a great opportunity for sharing lessons learned, for peer networking, uh, and hopefully, again, leveraging the expertise uh, and the experiences that do exist across the government. Uh, the OMB, in its guidance, required that agencies set up a data, go data governance body which again, um, we think is really, really important to have a central decision-making body that's responsible for setting and enforcing uh, priorities for managing data so that that data can be used as a strategic asset and used effectively. Um, we're, we're really excited about these senior officials. Um, we're, we're spending a lot of time giving them support and technical assistance. We held a multi-day orientation last fall for all of the senior officials, um, and we continue to provide support and resources both online and in person to support them in their roles. Uh, okay, I'll just touch real quickly on planning. So a couple of other new things that are part of this law. One, again, to the importance of, of evaluation is annual evaluation plans. So agencies are now going to have to lay out every year what are the significant evaluations that they intend to undertake in the coming fiscal year. Uh, capacity assessments is another one. Again, I mentioned this at the very beginning, the importance of an agency looking inward and saying, what is the capacity we have across the research, analy research analysis, uh, evaluation, statistics functions? <coughs> What's the capacity we have? to answer these kinds of questions, to do this work, where are we seeing gaps, and then to take the next step, hopefully, and try to figure out how to leverage what they have and also um, what are some other ways they might fill those gaps. Uh, I'll skip this one since I think this is probably uh, less important for this particular audience, but for those of you in the government, just know um, additional guidance from OMB is forthcoming. And like I said, that last piece on program eva evaluation standards and practices um, should be available at some point, hopefully today. Okay, so I'll end with some opportunities here. So I'm really excited about the Evidence Act, um, and I think you all should be excited too. No matter where you sit, if that's in government, uh, state, local, or federal, if you're in the private sector, if you are in academia or a research partner. I think all of us can get involved in this. Um, if you're interested in accessing data, whether that's open data or restricted use data, this law will present new and increased opportunities to use federal data for evidence building efforts. On the, again, on the point of evaluation, elevating evaluation I think is going to create a demand for more evaluative activities which again creates hopefully an opportunity um, for some partnerships to carry out these activities. I mentioned transparency earlier, I'll say it again, I think this does offer um, a new kind of transparency for agencies. Posting learning agendas, posting evaluation plans, those are really important. Um, it signals to the outside world, these are the things we, we care about. Um, it offers the opportunity, again, for research portfolios to become more aligned with policy priorities. And then the last point here, um, this is about culture change in many ways. So we think that the law presents an opportunity to further strengthen and continue to build an evidence culture across the government. Um, if we do this right, you know, we think that the Evidence Act can be a turning point in terms of building this stronger evidence culture across government. Um, I think everyone here listening in today is a key partner in making sure that that happens. Again, um, you know, this has to be embraced and it, it is going to be incremental progress, of course, um, but I think that this offers an opportunity for us to really shift the way we think about evidence building. All right, so I will stop there and I'm going to pass it off to Christina who's going to talk about implementation at the Department of Labor. Okay, so should I just go ahead and move in or are we going 
going to have any short questions for her, or should we just go to the next segment? Okay, all right, wonderful. Good morning, everyone. Again, my name is Christine Yancey. I'm the Chief Evaluation Officer at the Department of Labor. And I'm going to talk um, a little bit first about, at a high level, some of our early implementation experiences at the Department of Labor. Again, as Diana mentioned, this legislation was passed in January of 2019. So um, it, we are still sort of emerging in terms of developing our specific responses to some of these new requirements. And I felt like it would be helpful to talk about some of uh, some like large picture reflections and then sort of narrow down into some specific activities that we're undertaking that I think are capitalizing a lot on the spirit of the new legislation and the opportunities that this legislation presents. As Diana mentioned, the law is very expansive, um, aspirational somewhat, and it lays out a lot of uh, frameworks and sort of pillars, but we have to fill in those specific narratives with uh, actions that make sense for our department and so I wanted to talk about our experiences with this and I'm hopeful that those of you who are listening in can share some of your reflections on things that you've been doing and undertaking and, and, and um, provide some comments as well as any questions you may have. So in terms of DOL's early implementation experiences one of the first things I uh, feel like is important to emphasize is that we're able to build on a lot of existing processes and infrastructures at the Labor Department. We already had a process of developing learning agendas with uh, what we call our 12 operational or mission driven agencies. So we, we've been doing component level learning agendas for a good number of years. So while this new legislation requires a departmental plan, which we have not actually developed prior to this year, um, we do have the processes in place to work with our fellow partners and our subcomponents and they're familiar with the, the, the language around uh, the purpose of a learning agenda. So we've been able to leverage that, although we've expanded it to doing this work also with our four business offices. So we are um, directly engaging with mission execution and program administration in terms of developing these priority learning questions. And so that's been really helpful to be able to leverage those processes that have already existed in terms of those learning agendas. But I also think another um, opportunity that we feel has been very helpful and valuable is leveraging the existing processes and, um, and also relationships that our other evidence officials in DOL have already cultivated. So, and by that I mean our performance community, our statistics, our chief data officer uh, groups, because these are not specific lanes that we've, uh, in our program evaluation um, area, that we've sort of uh, institutionalized in the past. And I think the legislation uh, sort of permits these relationships and these coordination um, at a department level that we feel has been really helpful to reinforcing what are our sort of combined and collective aspirations to increase the application and use of evidence um, to drive decision making and to improve programs and policies and to make them more efficient. So, you know, I encourage for all of you as well that if you have not necessarily had a learning agenda process, but there are other processes that your other evidence officials have been using to, to help kind of um, find some efficiency gains in terms of how you can sort of work together to promote, I think, a very um, shared agenda. And we found that to be really helpful. I would also offer, though, that in the space of these many advantages to leveraging our existing processes, we also are aware that there's, I wouldn't call them, I put them up as cons, but I would say they're more like cautionary notes, which is that when you are messaging to your stakeholders in, internally, we have found that to push out the fact that there's a lot of continuity and ability to leverage existing processes that perhaps others may then not notice so much the change though, that also isn't necessary that while we do have a lot of great uh, activities that are already occurring that we can take advantage of to help meet the spirit of this legislation, there is still change required across all of our agencies. And it does uh, present an opportunity to have a culture shift, but that, that, that message of describing ways that you can take advantage of existing processes has to be balanced also with the communication about um, about the changes and I think one of the ways we've been able to help facilitate this is to, to discuss visions and future states so that others can appreciate how um, you can take advantage of the current operations and infrastructures but that there is still a migration to something different in the future and that's something that we found to be um, important to keep in mind as you're also trying to take advantage of things that are already institutionalized to reduce burden and also to sort of maximize 
the sort of existing um, infrastructures. Okay, so um, anyway, so I just wanted to, we, I was just talking about DOL's early implementation experiences at a high level and then going to move into some specific examples of changes that we're undertaking. One of the things I wanted to mention is that is that in the space where there's going to be increasing transparency to the activities and to the evidence building outcomes that come out of the, the work that we invest in, I think it's also important for those of us that are championing this work to recognize that increasing transparency also means increasing accountability, which also means that there are those that are going to be, uh, have some risk aversion to, to this work. And so I, I feel like what is helpful for those of us that are that are introducing these concepts to our agency is to recognize that while there are some spaces where when there's a lot of transparency and accountability related to specific investments, to also recognize that we can balance those with smaller scale activities that in involve some experimentation. You know, as Diana mentioned, they included a lot of like key words within um, the information about the public documents, which is that it's not meant to be incorpor incorporating all of the work that you're doing, but instead priority areas and to emphasize significant studies. And so what I think that is valuable for us is to say that when there are those particular activities that sort of elevate so that folks are comfortable with these public communications and accountability, then we, we elevate those uh, products to that level, but that we also have to engage in experimentation, innovation, to have small scale investments so that we're able to promote the learning cycle in a way that allows us to sort of move ideas up the chain to transparent um, areas, but that we also are encouraging small level iterative engagements that then can elevate to these um, larger scale commitments. So I think it's important as we're rolling this out as the implementers to emphasize that we want to have both of these at the same time and recognizing how leaders may be, may be responding to this and, and wanting to make sure that we're balancing and supporting this culture of learning and not just thinking about this from the compliance aspect. Um, and to that end, I, I think another thing that's really important is to have, um, to really firmly communicate about roles and expectations. And when I say, I, I think there's the roles that are, that are identified in the legislation, but there's also expectations that are implied by this. And, and for those of us that are in these evidence official roles to help our agencies, those that are users of the data, users of the information, to communicate what their roles are in this process of learning. And one of the things we have found to be um, particularly important in that is to reinforce policies uh, around evaluation in particular because there are those that haven't worked in the evaluation space before, they're not aware of the particular pillars that are involved. And I just wanted to throw this up. This is another part of the requirements of the legislation that, that the CFO Act agencies establish evaluation policies. This is the policy for the Department of Labor. It's built on five principles. Uh, for the sake of time, I'm just going to throw these up and then move on because I wanted to talk about how we are uh, taking advantage of building our administrative data capacity for implementation. Uh, but I did just want to mention that an important part of having uh, and creating partnerships with our users is to make sure that everyone is clear from the from the get-go with your projects about the um, expectations around the work itself. And for evaluation, it's very clear that we. We find our, the need to revisit these uh, pillars of our policy on a frequent basis. In particular, that all of the work that we do, for example, is independent. That once we um, have a research question and we engage in those activities, that work is done in an independent manner until its conclusion. And it's important that all the stakeholders are aware of, those, of these different rules of engagement depending on the type of evidence building activity you're undertaking. Because there are different rules when you're thinking about data analytics, uh, evaluation work, statistical activity. So I think as we're trying to, um, I think, uh, socialize our our, uh, our stakeholders around these different types of activities, that it's clear um, what those rules are. So I wanted to uh, move into describing sort of opportunities that we're taking advantage of. At the Labor Department, one of the key, I think, incredible opportunities on the horizon that the Evidence Act is helping to facilitate is to increase our capacity to use our administrative data to improve programs and operations. Um, you know, I think that at the present moment, there are a number of, uh, that we're sort of at this confluence of a number of, I think, great um, environmental factors that sort of really support this idea of, of coming up with new and better ways to make it take advantage of our existing administrative data. 
There's the establishment of the chief data officer. That's new for the labor department, and I know for a lot of the other agencies. There's also our department established a data governance body. Uh, there's the fact that the agencies uh, have tight margins with their time and people resources. I know that there's, you know, challenges with having um, with needing information faster and cheaper. And so one of the ways you can do that is by maximizing your administrative data resources. And I put this up as sort of like these are sort of aspirational bullets for us that one of the, these are the things that we're searching for is to come up with ways to be able to create um, opportunities to work across. Um, what I put in here, as I said, to support interaction across the hierarchy. And, and what I mean by that is that often when requirements come down from legislation, um, you know, the top level decides how that particular agency is going to implement that particular requirement. Well, when we are, what, one of the things we're trying to do is to create a, a democratized space for data access because there can be needs to answer high level mission driven questions that the leadership determines, but there's also, if we're trying to also support the iterative development, experimentation, we have to create um, environments that all users can intersect with and that, that ideas can come from the top and from all different levels within an organizational structure. And so one of the ways we are trying to do this in the labor department is to bring um, easier access and to facilitate uh, the ability to create use spaces for our administrative data. And so what we're doing, this is a simple graphic to describe this tool that we've been working on. So my office and the chief evaluation office, we have a, a small data analytics unit. And our data analytics unit five years ago um, experimented with a, a pilot, what we'll call a data analytics platform. And what I mean by this, because I'm sure with this audience being very technical, I can kind of spit some of this information out that you would find to be useful, that it's a, a server-based clustered file system. It's for managing, analyzing, merging, visualizing data. We essentially have a, um, what I would call this a series of containers. These secure containers have a place where we can co-locate co analytic tools. We have Stata, SAS, R, Python, Julia, and it provides massive data storage in this clustered file system. We um, have a way that you can visualize data if you need for various leadership. There are various tools, and there's free access to this array of software. And we piloted this. Um, this is why it's in white, is that our data analytics group piloted this because we needed a place to be able to store and analyze and merge um, some sensitive data. This, this question emerged five years ago before the Evidence Act. We, we needed to do this for our evaluation work. And as time has progressed, we've realized that this particular solution for this one problem actually has an ability to solve a variety of enterprise issues and is solutions. And so. Um, so this, this particular pilot is something that during fiscal year 2020 and into 2021, we will be expanding to be an enterprise solution for the department. And um, something I think that's really interesting just to emphasize is the importance of these platform tools as requiring and leveraging the, um, the expertise of various kind of sec segments that are all related and, and interconnected, but yet typically don't necessarily have a space and a platform to work in a very integrated manner. And so we're finding that while our data analytics group developed this tool to help solve a data analytics challenge, that a solution necessarily requires that we, um, that our IT, our, our, our chief information officer and our data governance, our chief data officer, also play um, a, critical uh, role in the rollout of this product. And I think one of the key things I feel that the Evidence Act has really emphasized is this integration of, of these different um, sort of lanes of expertise to be able to solve problems that we all are seeking to solve but sort of need to leverage and capitalize on each other's specific strengths. So what I would say, for example, with our platform, the IT group is helping to develop the um, the IT governance to help to make sure that we have a modernized infrastructure to help support fast processing to move this particular file file ba the the server cluster file from um, the servers to the cloud. So we're developing a cloud migration. IT is handling that. Data governance is necessary to ensure 
that the data standards and data quality um, practices in, are in place, that we have data that are getting captured in a way that's fit for multiple purposes, and then the, the data analytics, which is the, the group that's helping to create the insights from the data to help with figuring out the um, sandboxing capabilities that we need. And then, of course, I've left some boxes blank, and these are for you know, our policy folks, those that are coming from different kind of user spaces. We have data security professionals. There's you know, this is something that we're just starting right now and identifying that our IT, our data governance and data analytics are the three kind of uh, communities that, that we're bringing together to form the, the initial launch for this, but we're recognizing that um, we need to bring in many different types of personnel into this to ensure that this meets um, all of the data security, data confidentiality, um, and then also all of the use cases that are potentially necessary within the department as well as to be able to develop access points for external users as well. I mean, we're, we're looking for this to be a solution uh, for a variety of data um, uh, to create many different kinds of insights uh, from our data for many different evidence building activities. So I wanted to share this. It's, it's still in early stages and I'm hopeful that in a year hopefully we'll be able to come to this group and share with you sort of this grand new product that we have um, final or at least in a more advanced state than it is even now. Jeff, did you want to ask? Great. Any yeah, let me uh, lead off with one question. Then I know we've had a bunch of questions from the online audience. Um, so this question has two parts. One, I'm thrilled to hear that these learning agendas are part of a strategic plan and they kind of define what are the key questions that we might want data to help answer. And I suspect, of course, a lot of the key questions come from within the agency, but I'm wondering, you know, just in the context of the Department of Labor, I'm part of a company, we're trying to hire, we might say, hey, you know what, we need some employees with these sorts of characteristics. Can a, a private entity help provide input to these learning plans? So that's one part of the question. The other part of the question is it's nice always to try and balance that demand for data with the supply of what data is being gathered. And then maybe to say, you know what, some of the data we've gathered over a period of time, nobody's really using it. Maybe there's no demand for that particular set of data. Is there a mechanism to kind of stop gathering data that's not really used so that we can kind of focus our energy and our resources on the data that's most valuable and that meets the demand? Those are great questions. So what I would offer is that, to Diana's point about the Evidence Act requiring stakeholder engagement, not only at uh, one particular point in time, but across the life cycle of the learning process. So stakeholders are expected to provide feedback at the planning stages, at the execution stage, and then at the um, sort of the results and then feeding that back into continuous learning. I would also offer that this that we are in the early stages of implementation, so it isn't totally clear exactly how all of the agencies will be responsive to this mandate, but this is there, and I think, and I encourage everyone to remind um, any of their points of contact about this, because it is true, this is part of the legislative requirement, and so I think, uh, you know, we're always looking for opportunities to be able to meet the spirit of that requirement. And so if there's recommendations for places that would be useful for us to help disseminate our plans or information, we're always interested to hear that. I think it's something that is TBD in terms of how that will roll out over forthcoming, uh, the forthcoming year or so, but it is it will happen across the, particularly the 24 CFO Act agencies that are required to do this. Yeah, and I guess to your second point about um, data being gathered that's not being used. I mean, Sunset. Yes, yes, absolutely. Like there, there are mechanisms for this. Um, again, it depends on a particular agency and their particular requirements and their particular processes, but this should all be part of this new data governance activity. So part of what the data governance body should be doing is looking across the agency at the enterprise and saying, what data do we have? What data do we need? What data do we have that we don't need? And what can we do about it? But it's again, it's bringing the right people together and doing this in a systematic way. That I think is the innovation here that's not currently happening in a lot of places, but that clearly there is a need. Excellent, all right. Uh, from our live stream audience, can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. You don't have to do it. Okay. Uh, so this first question was for Diana. Uh, where can we find the new policy that is dropping today? 
Yeah, so I say today that is my, <laughs> that is my hope. Um, so all of OMB policies are posted on um, the OMB website. It's an OMB memorandum. So I don't have a particular link for you at this moment, but um, it, there's, it will be easily available. As a convenience for everybody who's participating today, we can provide the link to the Summary of the Evidence Act, OMB guidance as soon as it's issued, yep. perhaps a link to your DOL evaluation policy, which I thought was interesting and kind of maybe people didn't catch. So we can provide those sure. links and, and any others you would like yeah, to suggest. Yeah, so I would also point folks to the guidance that we uh, released in July, which is M1923. Um, we can provide the link for that as well. All right, uh, our next question was, what approach is being taken to raise overall government awareness of everyone's responsibility in the data process? Data is not just a set of information, but all of the processes that are led to the gathering of that information. How do people at all levels in the chain understand their role in ensuring clean and accurate data for evaluation purposes? So I'll just do a very general answer, then maybe I'll pass to Christina for some specifics. Um, so I think the federal data strategy is a key part of this. So by elevating the importance of leveraging data as a strategic asset into the president's management agenda, I mean, that is a very strong signal that we think this is really important. Um, and, and I think that the data strategy lays out a set of principles and practices as well as an action plan that all agencies are responsible for undertaking. Um, so a lot of the specifics, what you just mentioned, are addressed in the federal data strategy. But again, I think it's this real recognition and focus on data and federal data uh, and the centrality of it in the work that we all do. Um, that, that I think, is, is extremely important. And I'll, I'll just maybe pass to Christina for your take. Sure, sure. I think one of the one of the key aspects of this is to identify a specific problem that you seek to solve because you can get leaders to have buy-in and to, to provide personnel and support for this work if you explain kind of a future space that they want to be in and what needs to happen to get there. So what I could offer as an example with this is that is that often for example we'll receive data and the purpose behind that is to to receive data from related to uh you know collecting performance information and that data is to come in and isn't expected to then be merged with other data now if you had a question that needed to be solved by merging those data you have to back out of that to see are those data fit for that purpose are those data is that data quality high are, are the metadata included so that we're aware of the fact that these data have this statutory allowance to be able to be used in these different ways? Like, so I think often it's helpful to start by asking a question that you're seeking to solve and then from there generates, I think, generalizable insights that can be applied across the board. But it's hard when you start with kind of the abstract and then um, are trying to get folks to buy in when there isn't a clear connection to how this will be useful to them. And so I think it's always helpful to start with use cases. So I'd like to ask, uh, I'm hearing kind of partly from the audience and also partly from you that this is a culture change. People may not always be using day to day, make data today to make decisions. And maybe there are some kind of key times when they should start to stop and ask themselves, do I need data? And at the same time, there's some uncertainty about roles. And so my thought was, there's a federal acquisition institute to go and learn about a curriculum about how to do procurement well. Is there going to be a federal data institute? Perhaps I should put in a plug uh, from REI's perspective. Johns Hopkins <laughs> has a great program. Should people just turn to Johns Hopkins to learn about new roles and about data culture? So this is a, a very important point, um, and it is being addressed in the federal government in a number of ways. So there is some work going on on an, upscale, an upscaling pilot um, for data analysts, for example. So that is uh, currently happening to figure out how we can upscale some of our current employees to have the skills we need to be um, effective data users and managers. So that is happening. If um, someone online wanted to join that, is that possible? How might they learn how? So I don't, again, I don't have the link right available for me. Sure. We'd be happy to find that information and send it out. But this is something the government is very well aware of. Doesn't preclude the need for outside training. Um, of course, you know there are lots of partners that provide really valuable training. 
Um, but I think there's also a recognition that employees across the spectrum need to be data literate, right? This is not just a particular job category, but this is now touching more and more of the work that, that many people do. And so this foundation, this focus on data literacy um, across the board is an important component. And again, sort of going back to the, the federal data strategy, um, assessing the data literacy of your workforce is one of the things that agencies are now undertaking. And in that same vein, someone asked, thanks for raising the issue of culture change. Have you seen a shift in how senior policymakers are using evidence for decision making? And do you think the Evidence Act has changed how decisions are made? So I think it's very early. Um, the law just, it's been a, it's been a year, um, and I think it's, it's probably too early to see major shifts. I think that this has certainly got the attention of a lot of people. Um, we're very encouraged by what we're seeing so far. Um, I'm very encouraged by the way that agencies are embracing this work. Um, agencies that traditionally have not had a really strong evidence building culture are seizing this as a great opportunity. To me, that's really encouraging. Um, you know, it, it doesn't say, there's room for improvement everywhere, but I think particularly for me to see it taking hold in some of these agencies where this has not been a core part of their work, um, the way they're embracing it, the way we're seeing folks um, work together is, I think, a, a very good start. Very similar. Uh, so the legislation and how OMB is implementing is certainly important. However, more critical in my mind is reskilling, upskilling key parts of the federal workforce who do not have the professional and or academic exposure to data science and analytic concepts that of the practical application of these concepts. What will OMB do in terms of provi providing guidance, a framework, or something to federal agencies about this training need? And of course, how will funding of the training work in the days of limited training budgets? Instead of telling Johns Hopkins. Um, so I'm going to punt on some of this question, some, part, some piece of this question. I think I'm actually at liberty to answer all anything about the budget um, in this forum. But I again will say that this is recognized as a need. Um, the federal data strategy does address this head on in the year one action plan. So that's something I would direct folks to. Again, we can give you the link for that one um, if you're interested. Uh, I will say also that um, we are doing our best to offer trainings, to offer workshops um, for federal employees, and we have a series going right now for federal employees on evidence and evaluation. Uh, we have a number of different trainings that are offered um, through the three councils that I talked about, so we're doing our best to provide opportunities as we can. But if you have anything from your particular perspective on upskilling? You know, I, I think the only, what I reflect on a lot is the fact that each of us comes from a trained discipline, regardless of, but regardless of whatever discipline you come from, you realize that you have to constantly be in a learning mode. Because I come from an evaluation background and I've spent all of this time now trying to figure out what these containerizations mean and <laughs> figuring out, you know, data infrastructure. Because to answer the things that I want, that I am interested in, I have to know about these other disciplines. And I think that you're, you, you naturally are, I think, also needing to have like a um, sort of a, a multi-step approach to this. Some of this is about formal, formally training people in specific disciplines, but also creating networks and opportunities that they can have experiential practices that help them bridge in a practical way, in a pragmatic way, with these other disciplines. Because where I see the greatest innovation happening is when you're looking at people who are coming at this from their di multidisciplinary angles and finding these threads and bridges to be able to leverage across their different strengths. And that's, that is where I see this being really critical. So I feel like one specific type of training, yes, it's helpful, but what's really critical is creating these networks and spaces so that people can work together and share um, on a routine basis their, 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 their specific um, expertise together. Yes, I, again, I love the idea that there's a kind of a clear demand in the strategy for what data do we need and what decisions do we need to make. What I wonder is, as that goes strongly forward within agencies, how they may collaborate across. And I want to offer a specific example of something where I think that's a fantastic use in the past of that cross-collaboration. It's collegescorecard.ed.gov. Uh, uh, and essentially, it's a combination of information about what college a student graduated from based on their application for aid and, and what year they graduated. And then 10 years later, 
there's a combination of that data from the Department of Education with data from the Internal Revenue Service that says what's their salary or what's their declared income on their income taxes. And of course, after matching it up with the Social Security number, that allows you to say, well, what's the earnings of students at any given college? And then, of course, the, identif the identifying information, the Social Security number, is stripped out. And it allows you to say, well, how valuable is a degree at one college or another? What are the earning prospects of one type of degree versus another? And in that sense, I have a kid in college, and I'm very interested in that. But that couldn't come about with just one agency's effort. Department of Ed could not do that alone, nor, frankly, could the IRS do it alone. So my question is, how can we find opportunities for this kind of cross-agency data sharing and then maybe how do we overcome some of the hurdles to kind of cross-agency data sharing? Any perspective on that? Yeah, so this is something we've been talking about basically since the law was passed. Um, it's very much on our mind as well. We want to capitalize on this kind of uh, data sharing across agencies. And in fact, that's what Title III, a big part of Title III of the Act is designed to do, is to, again, facilitate better data access um, for agencies to share with each other as well as with external parties. Um, there are a number of things that we're uh, considering at this point. So I think sharing the learning agendas is a great first step. Having agencies talk about what those priority questions are, figure out where there are shared uh, shared goals is one. Um, there are some mechanisms being put in place through the president's management agenda and other um, other structures to elevate these government-wide kinds of questions so that we, again, are surfacing the kinds of questions that can only be answered by not only just merging data, but by thinking about um, you know, the perspective that each of these agencies bring to the table. So this is, I mean, you make a great point. It's something we're very much focused on, and we, we're hearing a lot of demand from the agencies themselves to do this kind of sharing. So they are you know, starting to talk to each other already and figure out where there are common purposes. So our audience online shouldn't just look at their own agency's learning agenda and demand for data. They should look at other agencies as well to get some ideas. Yes, absolutely. And I think that's where the transparency element is going to be huge. Um, we're going to be able to see each other's questions and talk about it more freely with each other, as well as hopefully have structures and infrastructure in place so that when it comes time to sharing the data we need to answer these questions, some of those barriers will be removed. I don't think it's a lack of will or a lack of desire. I think it's just been there are processes in place that make this more challenging than it needs to be. We want to break down some of those barriers. So we have two more questions that have come in. Do you think we have time for both or should I pick my favorite of the two? Just, we'll, we'll try to do what we can. We'll roll through them. All right, so Eric asks first, um, what impl implications does the Act have for IT platforms? With respect to interagency collaboration, data warehousing, and public transparency, does Max.gov become more or less important? And finally, do any particular cloud services offer useful capabilities? So I am definitely not the IT expert. Um, I probably am not the best one to answer this question. Quite honestly, although I will say that Max and platforms like it are incredibly important and thinking about what the next generation looks like is, I would also offer that I think we have a great opportunity right now in terms of thinking about culture, in terms of motivating culture change, not only around the use of evidence, but also in appreciating that we can protect the security of personally identifiable information in a manner that still allows us to be able to um, learn and help and support um, the 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 American public with the resources that we've been invested, that has been entrusted with us to help improve programs and policies. And I think we can do both. And I, I feel like in the past it had been that there was a tension between um, privacy and confidentiality and um, and being able to use that information to, to improve programs and policies. And I think, you know, with the sophistication um, and it's, not only is it more sophisticated, but it's also cheaper to be able to have very safe um, data exchanges in a way that, d that does not jeopardize um, privacy and security for individuals. And so I think this is something that also I think the Evidence Act is coming at a timely point because there is this change and um, this is also part of the culture changes to be able to communicate that. All right, last question. Okay. 
Uh, thanks so much for the presentation. Very interesting to hear about the Evans Act and imagine the change it could accomplish. As the speakers noted, legislation like this carries the risk of becoming a bureaucratic exercise rather than a cultural shift towards data-driven policymaking that it needs to be. What does success look like to you? How would policy development and impl implementation look different? How would the operations of agency look different? How do we know we're making progress towards this goal? So there's a lot in there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Pick your favorite of the four. <laughs> so I will say for me, um, what I would like to see happen is that evidence has a seat at the table when decisions are being made. So I think we recognize that there are a lot of different factors that feed into decisions, whether that's an operational decision, a policy decision. But what I want to see happen is that evidence has a seat at the table that um, it is part of the decision-making process, whether that's a small decision or a big decision, and that it's, the evidence is coming in a timely way, and that it's being um, produced in a way that's high quality, and then it's communicated to decision-makers in a way that they can actually use the information. So we haven't talked a lot about that piece, but that's the critical last step. It's not enough to just put it out there, but you have to have, be, have the skills to then communicate it in a way that the decision-maker can use the information. Well, I want to thank our speakers um, so much. Um, I think it's a perfect note to end on. Um, uh, I want to remind everyone watching that our next event will be on May 5th. You'll be receiving email communication about that. Uh, and you can also check out the websites of Hopkins and REI Systems for information on the May 5th event. And we will absolutely be sending out links to some of the issues that were raised during the presentation as well. So keep on the lookout for that. Thank you very much again for your time and to our speakers. Sure. 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 Sure.